I know that I'm going to walk away from this mic, so if, if you can't hear me at some point, just give me a, a holler. Okay? I moved in 1979 from Dayton, Ohio, before most of you guys were born, to the Granite Village. <laughs> My first apartment here in the village was on Bleecker Street, the old Mills House Hotel between Thompson and Sullivan. And I fell in love not just with the architecture and the charm of Greenwich Village, but with its history. And I think my favorite period is that 30-ish year period between the 1890s and the mid-1930s, when Greenwich Village gained its real reputation as New York's Bohemia. When the artists and sculptors, and painters and poets all converged on Greenwich Village and changed its personality. I think we can actually date that back to the 1850s when they uh, built the uh, 10th Street Studio Building, which most of you know was built exclusively for artists. And I think that was really the first step that started bringing in all of these incredible minds and talents to Greenwich Village. <clears throat> By the 1890s, a lot of the old houses and buildings and the new ones were sprouting artist studios, especially on the top floors, with these vast um, skylights that let in the northern light. But at the same time, something was happening below the sidewalk level. And those were the tea rooms, the little cafes and coffee houses, where all of these incredible minds would come together in the evening and they would talk about literary movements, and social reform, and politics, and art, sometimes just by candlelight. <clears throat> and these are those little subterranean places that actually formed the personality of Greenwich Village when it was New York's answer to Paris's left bank. So tonight we're going to talk about a few of my favorite of these places. And we'll start out here with number 129 McDougal Street. <clears throat> this house was one of a small string that was built between 1828 and 9 by a man named uh, Alonzo Alvard. Now, Alvard was not a developer. Uh, he was actually a hatter. He sold hats. But he got on the great building boom of the 1820s in Greenwich Village that started with the yellow fever epidemic in New York City, which of course was far to the south. Thousands of people were dying that year, and anyone who could afford to fled up here to Greenwich Village, where it was surrounded by country estates of the wealthy and um, farms, and the air was certainly much healthier. So Alonzo Alvar built these four houses, um, they were not mansions by any stretch of the imagination, but they weren't working class either. Um, they were clad in Flemish brick. Um, you can see the beautiful paneled lentils. And it's hard to see in this picture, but they have lovely federal doorways. And of course, the iron works with those wonderful stylized pineapples, which welcome, a sign of welcome and hospitality. This particular little house at 129 uh, became a boarding house after the Civil War. But after the turn of the century, it had a studio in the attic. The studio was uh, owned by, or it was, that's where uh, famous portrait photographer Nicholas Murray had his studio. That's his studio right there. You can see the big window that they punched through the peak roof. In this picture, you can still see the individual dormers are still there. Now, Nicholas Murray was the most famous tenant to live in this house, but he wasn't the most colorful. That would have been a young Polish woman who arrived in New York. Her name was Eve Hotchiver. When she got here, she changed her name to Eve Adams. She rented the basement level of this house, and she opened a tea room called Eve's Hangout. Kind of a modern name. Um, she was a, a writer, and she was a lesbian, and those two 
factors, I think, brought her to Greenwich Village. The difference between Eve's tea room and most of them, of the others, was her clientele. She had poetry readings, she had literary discussions, occasional music uh, presentations, but she only catered to women. She put a sign on the door that said, men are admitted, but not welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Eve was extremely comfortable with her sexuality, and she was very open, and she was probably, well, not probably, she was a little too open for, for the first half of the 20th century. One newspaper said that Eve's coming <coughs> out was not a healthy place for a she adolescent, and it was not a comfortable place for a he man. <laughs> and she earned the nickname the queen of the third sex. Well, all of this notoriety, they caught the attention of the New York City Police Department. <clears throat> and so one day in 1925, a young woman came down the steps to Eve's hangout, and she engaged Eve in in conversation, and before long, Eve brought out this collection of short stories she had been writing. She was going to uh, compile them into a, a book called Lesbian Love. Well, before the end of the day, Eve was, at, or, yeah, Eve was in jail. She was uh, arrested on two counts. One was disorderly conduct. The detective said she had made overt sexual advances. And she was also charged with possessing obscene literature, which of course were her, her own stories. He was convicted. She spent a year in jail, and not in jail, in the workhouse. And when she was uh, released, she was deported. Oh. So that was the end of really a very interesting chapter at 129 McDougal. Yes. What year was that? 1925 to 6. Um, Nicholas Murray stayed in the house, and in 1930, they joined the two dormers at the top and lifted the roof to give him a more comfortable studio. And in 1950, the parlor floor of this house became a home decorating shop. And that year, they punched out the parlor windows and made that big showroom window there. And today, it's an Italian restaurant. <clears throat> And it's really an incredibly colorful story of New York City or New York Greenwich Village history, which not many people remember. Eve's Hangout is probably the first form, well, formal, the first real lesbian gathering spot in, in Greenwich Village. Now nearby is this little house, which we all know is the Washington Square Diner. When the McDougal House was built in 19 or in 1828 and 9, this house had been here for at least a generation. It was built on the eastern edge of Greenwich Village, um, and it was a two-room, a two-story two frame farmhouse when it was built. In 1828 as well, the first mansion was uh, built nearby on Washington Square, and as those mansions ringed the square, that upscale tenor of, of the neighborhood spilled down onto the side streets, <coughs> including West Fourth. And mansions inched up right to the edge of this little house, and somehow it survived. So in 1915, a Greenwich Village sculptress and um, costume designer and theatrical set designer, Edith Unger. She rented the, the basement of this building, and she opened the Mad Hatter Tea Room. The Mad Hatter is credited with being the first tea room in Greenwich Village, and a lot of people will argue that because they were earlier ones. The point is that all of those other ones served other things, like wine or ale. So Edith only did tea. That made her a real tea room. She invited all of the artists who would come here to paint on the wall, to sketch on the wall, especially if it had anything to do with the theme, the Alice Wonderland theme. 
And over the doorway, she put a big sign that said, down the rabbit hole, all in backwards letters. <laughs> in that first year, she hired a young girl. Her name was Eliza Criswell. Uh, Eliza had graduated from Bryn Mawr in 1904. She had been the basketball captain there. She made her living teaching languages, but she took a job here at the Mad Hatter just to make extra money. She, like Eve Adams, was extremely comfortable in her sexuality. She preferred to be called Jimmy, or James or Jim. Uh, she cut her hair short, and she preferred to wear artist smocks. And this is Jimmy right there. You can see the, the sketches over the fireplace that the artists had done. There's a lot of teapots sitting around. And there's Jimmy out front of the, the front door, with down the rabbit hole. When we were going through these slides, someone said, oh, you got, you got reversed. And that's the way it was. This is an interesting side note. These two pictures came from the Library of Congress, and both of them are labeled a young boy at the doorway. <laughs> and that's Jimmy Criswell. <laughs> well, Jimmy met a girl here. Her name was Matilda Spence. And the two of them developed a relationship. They got an apartment nearby. And in 1916, Edith Unger sold them the business. Now, some people say it was because she simply had too much on her plate to run a tea room. And other people say it was because the West 4th Street residents were really pressuring her to get out. <clears throat> Whether or not, they, she sold it to the two women. Their relationship didn't last. Matilda eventually got on a steamer and went off to Europe. But Jimmy stayed on running the, uh, the Mad Hatter. She started writing a weekly newsletter called Mad Hatter Mutterings, which was actually a lot of fun. She just put down her humorous thoughts. And there was satire and poetry and things. She stopped teaching. She spent all her time. Um, at the Mad Hatter. And one of the things she wrote about in Mad Hatter Mutterings that she would complain about were what was called slummers. And if you were around in the village, around World War I, you would know what slummers were. Women's magazines started writing these articles about the tea rooms. And they wrote about them in very romantic, exotic um, terms, calling them very bohemian. And women could go there and smoke in public, and women could go there without a male escort. So women from Murray Hill and the Upper East Side with their fur collars and their plumed hats would get together and they would come down as a big adventure to go slumming in all of these tea rooms. And it was to a great annoyance to the people who lived in the village. And one day, or one week, uh, Jimmy Creswell wrote, wrote in her mutterings, that the front room of the, of, the, of the Mad Hatter was infested with old women. <laughs> Her, she had a very interesting clientele here. Um, the Gish sisters, Dorothy and Lillian, came here a lot. You remember that this was the center of the motion picture industry at the time. Sinclair Lewis was frequent, uh, frequented it, as did uh, Lewis Mumford. And then the journalist uh, Heinrich Wilhelm Van Loon started coming in. And he liked Jimmy a lot. And he lavished her with um, compliments and attention. And she responded very warmly to that. And she started doing domestic chores for him, like ironing his shirts and things. And I think much to everyone's surprise, they got married. <laughs> but it didn't last. <laughs> They divorced, and Van Loon married the playwright Francis Goodrich James. But that didn't last. <laughs> they divorced in 1927, and he came back to Jimmy. No one is really quite sure if they actually remarried, but they were together. When he died in 1944, she inherited his entire estate. Now, by that time, she had closed the matter. She closed it uh, during the Depression years in the 30s. And then, during the next 
few decades, the entire entranceway was paved over. There's a, one of those trap doors there now. And then our Washington Square Diner moved in, and that's where everyone remembers. The little building is over 200 years old. It looks much like it did in the 60s. But again, no one really remembers this really wonderful chapter in Greenwich Village history that happened below the stairs there. And almost right next door, number 146, is this sorely abused federal mansion. This is one of those houses that I mentioned that sort of spilled down the block from Washington Square. When it was built in the 1830s, it was three and a half stories. That top story there was raised. Originally, there would have been two dormers through the peaked roof. The uh, skylight for the studio was added. And you can see that they punched through on the western wall there to make studio windows where the windows were. This was a very high class house. Originally, it had an exquisite federal doorway with a fanlight and marble steps. But again, by uh, the turn of the century, it, has been, it was housing mostly uh, um, artists. Now, as I mentioned, at this time, New York City was the epicenter of the silent film industry. So in 1915, a married couple, Dr. Carlisle Sherlock and his wife Viola, decided they'd give acting a shot. Now, they didn't need the money. They owned a 300-acre estate in New Jersey. But they thought it'd be something to do, I guess. And they actually did pretty well. They, for the next few years, they, they landed a lot of parts, um, a few parts anyway, in silent movies. And then in 1918, they decided that was enough of that. So Carlisle Sherlock rented this house. And he converted it for his wife um, to the pepper pot. And there you see it. You can see the original federal doorway there. Pepper Pot is a little different. Actually, it's a lot different than the last two buildings we talked about. Because while the main section of the Pepper Pot was below the stairs, it actually went all the way up through, through the building. This was the basement, or the cellar level, where this was the main dining room, where Viola served her southern cooking, chicken and dumplings, fresh biscuits, homemade peach pie. <coughs> You'll see all around the walls there are pictures of motion picture stars. These are all people that the Sherlocks had come to know during their acting career. And this is also one reason, I think, that the Pepper Pot was a phenomenal success from the minute it opened. Al Jolson was here all the time. People of that nature came here because they were friends with the Sherlock's. They were stage stars and screen stars and even opera stars who came for dinner at the Pepper Pot. <coughs> so then other people would come to the Pepper Pot to see who was at the Pepper Pot. So it was constantly crowded. You also notice that Viola decorated the ceiling just as we would with dried peppers and Chinese lanterns, which makes total decorating sense to me. <laughs> Now notice also on these two tables, you'll see these big, globby, volcanic-looking candles. This was a trademark at the Pepper Pot. They would allow the candles to drip and drip and build up and build up and build up, and then the artists and sculptors who lived in the neighborhood would sit there, and they would carve the wax into these exquisite sculptures. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring one of those pictures. They're, they're truly incredible. And then the artist would go home, and the wax would drip and drip and drip and cover up those beautiful sculptures. It was just an ongoing thing. The floor above was called dance floor number one. And you can see Viola kept a pretty good wax on that floor. I have no idea what all that green stuff is on the, on the ceiling. Above that was dance floor number two. And above that was what they called the bridge room. I don't think anyone ever played bridge in that room, but they rented it for private parties and dinners, things like that. And when it wasn't being used, it was very often the scene of uh, Carlisle Sherlock's chess matches, tournaments. He had national tournaments here. He was extremely well known. 
And the top floor was Viola's personal studio. She wasn't an artist. It was just her little getaway. Uh, Carlisle fitted it out for her so she could entertain people there. They lived directly across the street at number 145. They had an apartment there. But this was Viola's little getaway. I don't know who shot the deer. <laughs> but you'll notice on the piano as well, there's some, some more uh, movie star pictures. And there's the pepper pot hostesses. <laughs> Most of these young ladies came from NYU. They were co-eds and they waited tables at uh, the pepper pot just to make extra money. Now, as I mentioned, the pepper pot was opened in 1918, right in the middle of Prohibition. This was a time when restaurants and even hotels were failing because of Prohibition. But the pepper pot just forged on. It did extremely well. And the truth be known, if you knew the right people, you could get a drink at the pepper pot. Um, and only once or twice did Carlisle or Viola get in trouble, which is to say arrested for violating Prohibition. So it wasn't Prohibition or alcohol that was the trouble at the pepper pot, it was jazz. In the 1920s, jazz swept America, swept New York City, and certainly swept Greenwich Village. And you have to remember that in the 1920s, there was no air conditioning. So on those hot summer months, or nights, when the bands were in there playing the Black Bottom and the Charleston, and these women were dancing away with rolled down hose and flapper dresses and bobbed hair with men in jackets and straw voters. That music was coming right out on the West 4th Street and no one was sleeping. <laughs> so in 1921, two women from the block, one incidentally was the Sherlock's landlady, sued them. They sued because they said that no one could get any peace on the block they said their property values were plummeting, and they hinted that women and men were stumbling out of the pepper pot so inebriated that they fell into the curb. So when the day of the um, hearing came, Carlisle, Carlisle Sherlock, excuse me, he was ready. The first thing he told the judge was that if his landlady's property values were falling so much, it wasn't reflected in his rent, because in 1920, he was paying $25 a month for that apartment, and in 1921, he was paying $125 a month. And then he brought up a string of, of witnesses who told the judge that the pepper pot was so quiet that they could sit and play chess for hours, <laughs> concentrating, never distracted by the noise. So the judge dismissed that case. <laughs> there were two rather disturbing instances that happened in 1925 and 26. The first in 1925 was December 9th, when 70 sophomores from City uh, College decided to lease the the bridge room for a smoker. <coughs> and that would have been fine, except there were 200 freshmen who thought it would be a great sport to crash that party. Well, they not only crashed that party, they went through every single floor of the pepper pot. They overtook the dining room, breaking the tables and chairs and china and glassware. They stampeded over the coat check girl, really injuring her. Um, they went through all, all four floors even into Viola's private studio where they did some serious damage, including two antique Egyptian vases. It turned into quite a riot because the diners were very upset. So they picked up those broken table legs and chair legs and they started beating these students soundly. When it was all over, except for the poor coat check lady, everything returned to normal. Nobody was arrested and nobody was uh, charged. Now, at the same time, there was a pianist here, a piano player. His name was George Schrag. He was 28 years old. And he, had, uh, he came from Auburn, Washington. 
where he had been classically trained as a concert musician. George came to New York City to further his concert <coughs> career, and he found out, like so many singers and entertainers and models do today, New York City is a really big pond with a lot of big fish. And George wasn't doing so well. And so he took a job at the Pepper Pot. And things were going okay until June of 1926, about six months after that riot. <laughs> when he got a letter from his mother who said that she was on the way to visit. Well, George was terrified. And he told his friends he could not face his mother and let her know that he wasn't on the concert stage, he was playing in the jazz job. So about a week before she came home, or she came here, he left the pepper pot, he went to his furnished room on West 12th Street, he stuffed the cracks in the doors and windows with newspapers and rags and he turned the gas on. So his landlady found him the next morning dead. It was a very dark day at the pepper pot, as you can imagine. The Sherlocks retired in the 1930s, but the pepper pot went on under new management. It changed a bit, but times are changing. So in the 30s and 40s, it reminds me, I always think of it like one of those black and white uh, Fred Astaire movies. The, one of those floors was now called the Voodoo Room, and it had uh, torch singers. And one room had all kinds of uh, tap dancing people. But it was still an incredibly successful spot. It was probably, at least at one point, the most popular spot in, in Greenwich Village. And it was nationally known. This was a big deal. But of course, not every, the things don't stay as they are. In 1961, the building was converted to apartments on the upper floors. The parlor floor and the cellar remained a, a club. It was called the New Showcase. It was run by the Gambino crime family. <laughs> and that was shut down in 1971 as an illegal after hours joint. Today, the pepper pot is unrecognizable. Where Al Jolson used to eat chicken and dumplings is now a, a laundry and dry cleaners. The second floor um, is a nail salon. The gorgeous doorway is gone. And again, this is such an incredible piece of Greenwich Village history that we've all forgotten about. I don't really know anyone who knows about Pepper Pot, except for me. <laughs> <laughs> this really handsome row of um, townhouses on West 11th Street certainly do not hint that there were ever was ever a below-the-ground establishment here, but there was. This row of houses came pretty late to the party for Greenwich Village. They were built in 1853 by a man named James uh, Gibbons. He had inherited the undeveloped plots. When they were completed, they were extremely high-end homes. And by the way, notice the studio window up there on that, that one. Number 64, right there in the middle, Despite uh, its very elegant, being a very elegant home, it was uh, being run as a boarding house within 10 years. By the 1890s, it was run by a, a lady named Anna, Annie Chase, and almost all of her boarders were from the theatrical and entertainment industry. And that's only significant because in the 19th century, people from the theater were not very welcome at respectable hotels and boarding houses. About the only place they could find accommodations were in Greenwich Village and the Upper West Side. So number 64 um, went on like that until 1907 when the building was sold. And that year, um, a, a married couple from Italy moved in. Their names were Qualo and Josephine Paglieri. They took rooms on one of the upper floors, and they started uh, working right away on converting the ground, the below ground floor, to a restaurant. And you'll notice there's a, a cast iron balcony right there, uh, actually wrought iron, 
None of the other row houses have it. That's because the Paglieri's put that in. And the reason they did so, it sort of formed a canopy over the entrance to their restaurant. And if you look very closely, you'll see E and P in, in the uh, design. That was for Enrico and Paglieri, which was the name of the restaurant. They opened in 1908. It was an extremely popular Greenwich Village location. This picture, you can see it opened out to the garden in the back. There's another view. As I said, it was an extremely popular destination. People from not just the village, but from all of Manhattan came down here. And they had no trouble, but they almost did. And that was because right about the time that they opened the restaurant, a woman named Juna Barnes, does anyone know her? <laughs> Juna Barnes wrote a book called Greenwich Village As It Is. There was something intrinsically wrong with this woman. And she didn't just write a guidebook. She sort of vented out all of her hatred and her, uh, her problems <clears throat> with people who did not match um, her way of doing things. She called Greenwich Village a place where women smoke and men make love. And she decided that it would be a good idea to list every single place where same-sex people gathered. So in this book, she listed Enrico and Paglieri. She didn't use the name, but she used the exact street address. So that caught the attention of a group called the Committee of Fourteen. That group had been formed in 1905 as part of the Anti-Saloon League. And originally, what they were supposed to be doing was differentiating between respectable, established hotel um, bars and saloons. That's what they were supposed to be doing. But they really got carried away with themselves, and they decided they would just ferret out everything that did not um, coincide with their definition of morality. So soon they were um, going after not only uh, saloons, but brothels and um, illegal gambling joints and places like this because they did not, the, the term they used was perverts. They were out to find those people. So after they, they got a uh, word about Enrico and Paglieri, they sent an undercover agent there, a female. And she came back and she reported that she saw two men there whom she thought were very effeminate. And they said, well, what did they do? Well, nothing really. And so she was sent back. And this time she came back and she said she saw women whom she thought were of that type. But again, all they did was like eat ravioli. So. <laughs> they sent her back about three or four more times absolutely bound and determined that they were going to find evidence on, on this restaurant, and they never did, and they finally threw their hands in the air and went about looking somewhere else. That was the closest that uh, Paolo and Josephine had at having any major trouble. He died in 1950, and Josephine continued the restaurant until 1971, when she died at the age of 95. And now, this is sort of a sad ending to, to this story, because that very same year, the house was being converted to regular apartments. The Paglieri's had no relatives in America. So the, the new owners took all of their things, their furniture, all their paperwork, their clothing, all the memorabilia that they had collected in nearly 70 years of running this restaurant, and they dumped it in the gutter for the, for the trash man. And the New York Times reporter got wind of this, and he went down to West 11th Street, and then he wrote about it. And he said he watched as, as people would take away Josephine's dresses because they were like vintage clothing. And one man who dumped out a suitcase and went through all the books and took the leather-covered ones, leather-bound, and dragged them away. And then he watched as the sanitation truck crushed all of their furniture into splinters. It was wintertime, and he said, finally, there was nothing left but one black and white photograph on the snow. 
And it was a picture of Josephine when she was a young woman. And he said that the, the sanitation man saw it, and he picked it up, and he held it in his hand, and he looked at it, and then tossed it in the truck with the rest of the rubbish. And that was the end of Enrico and Pagliari's. Today, the restaurant is um, part of the student center of, new, of the new school. And I can guarantee you that all of those hundreds of people who go in and out of the grass course every single day never look up at that E and P in the balcony above their heads and wonder, why is that there? And unfortunately, that's all the time I have. But if you <laughs>